Well, good afternoon, and welcome to Sharing Geoscience Online, this year's virtual annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. This year, we have more than 18,000 abstracts and have already had more than 19,000 unique users from around the world participating in our events. I'm Terry Cook, um, EGU's Head of Media Communications and Outreach, and I'll be hosting this week's press conferences, which include a question and answer period following the presentations by our four speakers. This is the first time we've ever tried completely remote press conferences, and so it's possible that we could experience some technical difficulties. If the platform suddenly quits during the middle of the um, session, um, I'll restart it and give you all about five minutes to rejoin the session. Um, I, however, have been having some internet difficulties, and so if you're not able to log back in, then we will definitely finish recording um, and still post this on um, EGU's YouTube video. The transitions can also be a little bit slow, so I ask for your patience while we test this new greener way of holding geoscience press briefings. Um, journalists, after the presentations are over uh, and during the Q&A period, please only use the Q&A function in Zoom um, to ask your questions. Please don't use the chat um, and don't also use the um, hand raising function. We're only gonna be using the Q&A. Um, the documents and um, abstracts relating to um, this press conference uh, are uploaded to the document section of the media website, which is media.egu.eu. And so please check there for more information. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce all four panelists now um, to make for faster transitions between them. The press conference is titled Epic Journeys, New Insights into Wildlife and Human Migrations. And our speakers today are Oliver Lamb, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Philippe Gaspar from Mercator Ocean, um, Operational Oceanography, Eileen Eckmeyer, a professor in the Department of Geography at Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich, and Lisa Talheimer, who's a doctoral student at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. I'm gonna now hand things over to them um, and then I'll open up the floor for questions um, after the scientists have finished presenting. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. All right, thank you, Terry, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this press conference. Um, so today I'll be talking to you um, about this project that I'm involved with. Um, which really is to try and test a range of geophysical instruments um, and see how well they work with uh, monitoring elf, wild Af African elephants. This project is really led by um, Michael Shaw, but it also involves uh, help from Stephen Lee, Jonathan Lees, and Sean Hensman. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background um, uh, to this project and the motivation behind this project. So, some of the motivation for, um, so some of you might know that wild elephants are still under a lot of threat, and that includes um, some poaching for the ivory, habitat loss, as well as human elephant conflict, where elephants might, um, well, elephants might wander onto agricultural areas and humans might want to drive them away or even kill them. So it's really important that we uh, keep track of elef wild elephant populations, make sure we know where they are and keep count of how many they are. Um, elephants are quite well known for their trumpeting noises, which are high frequency, but um, they also uh, use a lot of low frequency noises, which are also called rumbles, so the vocalizations they generate a lot of acoustic waves. These rumbles are quite important for elephants because they can tra travel quite far, up to three kilometers away from an individual elephant. The elephants are quite large as well, so um, they might also generate these uh, footsteps um, that we can record through the ground with seismic waves. So both of these seismic and acoustic waves can offer a really nice and not intrusive solution for monitoring and, and tracking wild elephant populations. And by not intrusive, what I mean is that we don't have to go up to the elephants and tranquilize them and put tracking collars on these elephants. Therefore, we don't, don't have to introduce any kind of stress to the elephants. So the idea is we just have to leave a sensor in the ground somewhere or in a tree somewhere and just wait for an elephant to come to these places and we can count these elephants and just leave these elephants be. So this is one of the sensors that we've been testing. It's one of the most interesting ones. This is actually a sensor, it's a low cost sensor that was originally designed for recording tectonic earthquakes atmospheric acoustics. And I've got an example of what it looks like here. So this is kind of the size of one of these sensors here. This is Raspberry Shake. 
because it just has the raspberry, this just has the seismic sensor inside it. What we've been testing is the raspberry shake and boom, which also has an acoustic sensor. So this particular package here can actually record waves coming through the ground as well as through the air. And it's really convenient and low cost. Um, as far as I know, this is one of the first documented tests of this particular sensor package in the field for recording elephants. And what prompted us to try and test this was actually, there's been a couple of um, experiments in the past couple of years where people have been using this package uh, in the field and um, had realized that this is actually a really nice uh, low cost sensor for using the field that can complement um, other much higher cost sensors. So we wanted to see how well this would work for elephants. So we took five of these sensors down to an elephant reserve in South Africa, where they have a herd of about seven elephants, two males, three females, and uh, two juveniles. And they're just allowed to wander around this 300 hectare um, area. And what the idea, is, uh, the idea was, we just wanted to record these elephants as they were wandering around this reserve. And we wanted to also record these reunion events. So what I mean by reunion events is that the herd might separate into two, or th two groups. Um, and when they come back together, they make an awful lot of noise uh, when they come back together. So this might be uh, because they're very happy to see each other again. They're just bonding. Um, so they make a lot of rumbling noises. And also because they're running towards each other, uh, they make a lot of uh, footsteps that we can record with our sensors. This is an example of what we recorded uh, in the field with our sensors. So in the top here, I've got um, uh, acoustic waves that have been recorded over a period of 120 seconds. And at the same time, it's the recorded by the seismic, seismic sensor inside the raspberry shake and boom. So it's very difficult to actually tell what is elephant and what isn't in these waves. So what we do is we take a, a frequency spectrogram. So this breaks it down to the various frequency components of the waveform. And what you can actually see here is some nice um, uh, wiggles that are coming through the frequency spectrogram. And what we think is that these are the um, elephants as uh, this is the rumbling of the elephants, individual elephants, as they're coming back together. It's not so clear in the seismic waveform, but sometimes you can actually see um, the rumbling noises, uh, the same rumbling noises appearing in the acoustic as in the seismic sensor. So what we think is that this is, this means that the, acoustic the acoustic rumblings are so loud, they're actually um, shaking the ground. Um, and this can be picked up by the geophone sensor. Um, and, because uh, we had five sensors, we were able to test how far away the sensors were able to record. And during this particular experiment, we were able to see uh, these rumblings up to 400 meters away from the individual elephants. So we also su successfully recording footsteps. So this example here, each of these peaks here in the seismic sensor, is, and just over five seconds, is what we think is a footstep from individual elephants. And you can see these uh, coming up nicely in the frequency spectrogram as well these uh, lines of um, frequencies. And this is coming from an individual elephant that was within 50 meters of the sensor. This is my last slide. So basically, from what we find is that we think there's a, a great potential for using the raspberry shake and booms um, for monitoring ground elephant populations. Um, the idea is that we can just put one of these sensors uh, in a place that we think elephants could congregate, such as a watering hole and just let the, the sensor just record data as it's coming in, and then um, just let the sensor automatically count uh, the elephants uh, or just record or send us an alert when there's a, an elephant herd in the area. We think we can improve the sensitivity range, so we can improve the detection range of the sensors. So we're planning to do more field tests in the near future, go back down to South Africa and just convert, uh, tweak how we put the sensor in the ground to try and improve the sensitivity of the, uh, the sensor. Um, there are my contact details if you want to know more about this um, experiment and our plans with the sensor. And as an article this detailing experiment is currently under review in the Bioacoustics Journal. Thank you very much. I think it's now Philippe's turn. Yes, next will be Philippe Gaspar. Okay. It just Let's takes see. a moment to switch over the slides. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, can you see on my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so what I will present is the work of a team made of uh, Maxime Lalier, a former colleague of, at CLS, who's working on uh, sustainable uh, fisheries, development of sustainable fisheries, and Pierre Giffard, Tony Candela, and myself, who are working at Mercator Ocean. Mercator Ocean is the company that operates the uh, Copernicus Marine Service for the European Commission. And uh, Tony's work is also supported by Upwell, a uh, US-based uh, non-governmental non organization that uh, deals with the protection of sea turtles when they're in the open ocean. So, well, the, the first thing you, you should know is that uh, we only have seven sea turtle species on hers. Uh, all of them are classified as uh, vulnerable endangered or critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And if you only take the, the biggest and the most emblematic one, the, the leatherback turtle, uh, uh, you must know that the, the Northwest Atlantic population of this turtle has decreased by 60% between 2010 and 2017. And if we're speaking of the Eastern and Western Pacific leatherback population, they have decreased by 95% uh, in the last three decades. So they're really endangered. As a consequence, I mean, lots of efforts have been made to protect uh, and monitor sea turtles on the nesting beaches. That, that's the place where, where they are most uh, easily accessible and millions of euros have been uh, uh, used to, to protect those nesting beach, so to protect nesting females and then the hatchlings when they get out of the nest and, and go to the sea. But we also need to protect the, the sea turtles at sea because uh, that's where they spend most of their time. They spend over 99% of their time at sea and they are highly migratory species. Uh, for example, uh, turtles that are born, leatherback turtles that are born uh, in the West Pacific in Papua New, New Guinea, they cross the whole Pacific Ocean and come to forage of California. Uh, and when they are at sea, they can be threatened by different uh, things. As you can see on the slide, like uh, oil spills. They can so also eat plastic bags and get their uh, guts completely clogged and, and die from it. They can be entangled in fishing nets or hooked uh, into, uh, well, in, into other fishing gears. So uh, we really need pr to protect them at sea, but um, to protect them, we know where they, we need where they are. Now, I, knowing where sea turtles are in the ocean is not, not really or not too much of a problem for adults because uh, as you see at this figure, uh, where you see uh, adult leatherback equipped with a satellite tag on the, on a, on the back, um, adults can be tracked, mostly females from, from their nesting beaches. And then we can have data from satellite tracking, as you can see on the figure. And you can see, for example, example of different uh, leatherback tracking from different nesting beaches in South America. And so from most or a large number of sea turtle population. We have a reasonably good idea of where sea turtles, adult sea turtles can be found and, and where we need to protect them. It's not unfortunately the case for hatchlings uh, because uh, hatchlings are much too small when they, leave, when they leave their nesting beach to be equipped with satellite tags. Well, there have been a few attempts, but uh, very limited ones. So. Basically, uh, where the hatchlings go when they, when they get into the water is not known. So hatchlings will get into the water and the next time we see them back is 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years later when female come back, uh, adult females come back on the, on the nesting beach. So this, this juvenile period spent at sea is, is usually called the lost years because we really know, don't know where, where they are. And uh, we only have some, some ideas and uh, the whole goal of our work has been to, to try to develop a model uh, to simulate actually, uh, to be able to simulate the dispersal of those uh, hatchlings and then juveniles in the open ocean uh, based on the very few knowledge or the very few information we have on, on, on their movements. And the thing we know about, about the hatchlings are, are, are really uh, very few. 
actually, well, we know that once they get at sea, I mean, they, they, are, they are advected by ocean currents, so they move with the ocean currents, they grow, and, uh, and also they swim. And, and uh, so based on the data we have at uh, Mercator Ocean, so we have ocean current data because it is our, our, our task to, to forecast and to simulate ocean currents. So we have daily forecast of, uh, or daily simulation of the evolution of the ocean currents. So we know that, that the hatchlings move with those currents. And we also know that they swim and their swimming speed, we have to model it. And that's the difficult part of the job. And uh, so we make reasonable assumption based on your know, also limited knowledge, but uh, we assume that uh, hatchlings will uh, uh, swim uh, at velocity that is proportional to their, their size. So small hatchlings uh, swim slowly, larger, larger hatchlings uh, swim faster, and their movements are directed to what, towards what we call favorable habitats, and that's mostly areas where the water temperature is favorable and where food can be find, found. Um, and uh, if you take my figure here on, on the screen, you see where you see the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, you see what I call the habitat suitability index that goes from zero, that is white, to one, which is almost black or dark brown. And, and uh, you see, for example, here at the very beginning of the simulation, <coughs> you see that the ocean is all dark, dark brown uh, uh, below 20 north about, and, and all white above it simply because what you see is, is the temperature limit. Basically, uh, hatchlings can survive in water down to 24 degrees C, but, above, uh, but when, when, when the temperature is below 24 degrees C, it's, it, they, they cannot survive in, in those waters. So basically, the limit be between the brown and the, and the white is the 24 degree isotherms. And I, as you will see in the animation, so what we do is that we release, we release uh, sea turtles, simulated sea turtles in, in, the, in the currents simulated by the Mercator model. And we let them, let them drift with the currents and, and move according to the law we set up. So, so all our turtles will, will move in order to, to, to remain in, in acceptable water temperatures and to find food, which is given by primary production, which is also simulated by the model. So let me just, show you what, what the simulation will look like. So you will see little blue dots that are individual sea turtles that are leaving their nesting beach in French Guiana. And the currents will, will take them where you will see. And we'll also see the habitat is evolving and mostly we will see the seasonal cycle of the habitat. So you will see temperatures going up and down as uh, the winter comes and then the summer. And the date is on the top of the figure. So you see, and basically there is one figure every 10. So this is typically a simulation of the evolution of, uh, of the trip of these turtles. The black dots, actually the, the, the dots turn black with the sea turtle die because they stay too long in too cold temperatures. So, so it's called stunning or cold induced mortality. And you see here we already at in year, year five or six. So you see that after six years, seven years, you start to have turtles arriving along the coast of Europe and, and Northern Africa and then eventually entering in the Mediterranean Sea. So those simulations show us where those turtles uh, disperse according to the, what, what we, we believe is, is their movement. Now as a summary, the, this is the summary of the, this whole simulation. This, this shows you all the places where, where the turtle have dispersed over a period of 18 years. And the color indicates the age of the turtles. So, so of course, on to the west of the basin, you have young turtles, and towards the east, you have older turtles. And the model predicts that you have a large density of older juveniles in the Bay of Biscay, so along the coast of France, along the coast of Galicia in Spain, coast of Portugal. We also see that the turtles enter uh, the Mediterranean Sea, but only the western part of the basin, and they concentrate also mostly in the Gulf of Gabes in Tunisia. And we have uh, turtles uh, also arriving offshore Mauritania. And uh, so this, this map is the first map of the dispersal of, of where, where uh, leatherback hatchlings from the Northwest Atlantic uh, likely are. Uh, I will not get into the data details, but data from, uh, from uh, strandings and bycatch confirmed that actually that, actually that the data were Juvenile leatherbacks are found stranded or by coat are those where the model simulates are going. So namely in the Bay of Biscay along the coast of uh, Portugal, in the Mediterranean Sea, in particular in Portugal, and also in uh, Mauritania. One interesting thing that you can see is, is that uh, 
basically what is uh, incredible is that the, the turtles that are that are getting first to the to, to the eastern part of the, the Atlantic basin are the Mauritanian one that you can see there is a there is a line of blue dots here so you, young turtles going taking a shortcut basically to Mauritania and this is confirmed by data actually the smallest uh, leatherback uh, found al along the coast of Europe and 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 uh, and the Northern Africa has been found in, in Mauritania and, and the model explains for the first time why it is so. So in the future, we hope that those data will be, uh, will be used to inform fishermen of the areas where they are most likely found, where they will most likely find uh, juvenile sea turtles so that, that they can avoid these area or take, or take uh, specific care of their fishing gear to avoid interactions with, uh, with the juvenile turtles. And of course, those simulations were made with historical data, but we have the capability of running this model in real time. So with, with nowadays currents or even forecasts for the next few days, so we can, we can provide fishermen or we could provide fishermen with a forecast of the distribution of uh, turtles and hopefully this will help reduce uh, bycatches. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philippe. Eileen will be next. And while she's um, sharing her slides, let me just mention that the photo of the hatchling um, that Philippe showed is available um, <clears throat> on the documents page of the EGU media website. OK, can I start? Yes, please. OK, hi, everybody. So firstly, I would like to introduce our team. So my name is Eileen Eckmeyer. I'm a professor for soil geography at the LMU Munich. And my colleagues come from different fields. So Simon Kübler is a geologist. Akida Meyer is a soil scientist, a PhD student. And Stephen Rosina is a botanist working at the National Museums of Kenya in Nairobi. So we are a quite interdisciplinary team. And I hope this will also be presented now by me, how these different fields come together to explain one of the biggest um, migrations which are happening in the world, or which is also very famous, the great wildebeest migration. And the seasonal animal movement in the savannah ecosystem uh, brings together about one million wildebeest species migrating through the region in a regular pattern. So while potential climatic and biological drivers for this large scale migration, including seasonal rainfall patterns and vegetation dynamics and also the seasonal variations in diet and water requirements have been addressed before. The role of rock chemistry and also soil diversity as a source and constraint for nutrient provision has not been studied before in greater detail. So our working hypothesis was based on results from the, from previous project, which was based in the Rift Valley in Kenya by my colleagues um, Simon Kübler et al. And this project focused on the understanding of early hominin landscape inhabitancy and animal migrations related to the distribution of soil nutrients in this region. So Simon and his colleagues found that topography and nutrient availability in the area control the movement of animals also in the past, and that the underlying rocks and sediments provided these essential nutrients due to their weathering. They could conclude that the presence of already paleolithic sites in this area was already related to the presence of grazing animals, despite of variations in climatic conditions over time. So in general, the Rift Valley is not a completely suitable place for grazing animals but the nutrient-rich hotspots promoted the establishment of grazing areas. So this figure shows that the seasonal grazing habitats of wildebeest correlate with specific environmental subregions. They are marked with numbers one to three, which are also our study areas. So for example, in the south, we have uh, higher precipitation, uh, sorry, lower precipitation, where the wildebeest uh, graze when there is more precipitation, so when, the, when there's the raining season. And then they move northwards and um, to regions which are drier um, and uh, where we also have different soil conditions. 
So there are different in general concerning geology, precipitation, also external factors like soil erosion. And in general, we could also see that geochemical variations together with continuous soil formation created a patchwork of soils with different nutrient status and that these soil characteristics are subsequently changed uh, by climatic effects, for example, precipitation changes, but also by external factors, uh, for example, overgrazing and subsequent erosion of soils. And these effects can also reduce the amount of nutrients and vegetation and also have an effect on the amount of plant nutrients and then also biomass available as fodder. So these later factors, the external factors, definitely need more attention. So when we come to our results, we could see that the three areas were very different concerning geology. So to be more specific, so the southernmost area uh, was dominated by volcanic rock or ash. So the precipitation is rather low and we have um, lower rates of weathering and therefore also lower releases of nutrients from the rocks. We have higher influence of dust inputs and also a rather short grass vegetation. Here we have deeper organic rich volcanic soils which are high in plant available nutrients, especially due to the impact of uh, the volcanic ashes and the dust. But we also have larger losses due to overgrazing and subsequent wind erosion. Area two, the transition zone in the center, is characterized by Archean basement rocks, for example, granite. We have here higher precipitation and also a higher rate of weathering. This results in slightly less organic rich soils with lower levels in specific nutrients. But here we also have effects of loss due to soil degradation, specifically water erosion or sheet erosion. And in area three, uh, where we have the, the highest amount of precipitation, we have a patchwork of Archean basement rocks and basaltic lavas, but also thick fluvial deposits and uh, other sediments. Um, we have stronger weathering processes and therefore also leaching of nutrients. We have less organic rich soils, lower levels in nutrients, especially on the basement rocks um, and higher levels on the basaltic rocks. So putting everything together, uh, we could see that the composition and degree of weathering of the different rocks and sediments influence the amounts of plant available nutrients and soils, which therefore control the grazing patterns of the herbivores. And we could also see that the connection between these factors is new. Um, so it was not studied before, but that the, the interplay in between these factors, geology, climate, and then also grazing patterns, is uh, very important to understand um, also how these patterns could change in the future, especially when we consider climate change. So if you look at the specific aims of our project, what are the negative factors, what is reducing soil fertility is a question which we will also study further in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to switch from animal migrations to human migrations um, with Lisa Talheimer. Okay, here we go. Hello everyone. Um, Today, I would like to talk to you a bit about uh, a bit of our ongoing research on climate displacement, humanitarian needs, and forecast-based financing. This project is also highly interdisciplinary. Uh, we actually work um, with a team at the Red Cross Climate Center, as well as at IFRC, which is the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent. Um, this research is uh, using very I would say unique methods uh, from, from the realm of climate econometrics, so bringing climate data and methods and tools from econometrics, so social, social science together. Um, and yeah, this is a really great uh, opportunity to show a bit um, what we have been doing and kind of the thought process of how we can use anticipatory action for climate-related displacement. 
I thought I'd start this talk by um, a comic which I've seen uh, quite often uh, across Twitter, but it, which I also thought is, is very uh, unique to our, our situation we find ourselves in at the moment. We have climate change going on, we have loads of conflict going on worldwide, um, the economy is, is, is going down as well as the ongoing pandemic COVID-19. And it looks a bit as if the disasters are collaborating better than we are. But we're trying to find a way with anticipatory action to kind of forecast what may or may not happen and act before a disaster happens. So setting the scene, what do we actually want um, with this talk? First, I think it's really important to, to dive a bit more into the methodology of what is actually climate um, displacement, um, what is forecast-based financing or short FBF, as well as uh, the applicability of forecast-based financing in the context of climate displacement. Um, starting with, with figure one, um, we thought it's very useful to have, um, to have a definition of uh, what climate displacement actually is. And as you see in uh, number two, um, the climate displacement is compelled, not voluntary. So this is one very important um, factor to distinguish migration, which is fairly voluntary from displacement. Um, you, have, you don't really have a lot of control over movements um, over time, but also the direction. And mostly climate related displacement is happening in the context of extreme weather events such as droughts or floods. Um, if we look on the figure a bit more to the left, we see refugee-like events, which is um, the absolutely forced um, uh, context, essentially. And number three, migrant-like events, which I alluded to before, more voluntary, more time, more control over where people go or not. Then we see on the right side, figure two. Um, here, we would like to show you uh, what's actually uh, climate-related displacement and what is conflict-related displacement. Most of the of displacement as a terminology has been put in context of conflict, but we see over the past years, from 2008 to 2019, that new displacements are actually much more occurring due to droughts, due to floods, due to heat waves and other extreme events. And I think this is a very important distinguishment and also to put this in context um, of slow onset events such as climate change. But when we look at uh, climate displacement itself, um, it has been very often put in the context of anthropogenic climate change, but not necessarily with the quantitative results supporting that. What I wanted to show you here on, in figure three is that um, both temperature and precipitation anomalies have been going on over the past years. So here in particular, over the month uh, January 2016 to December 2019. And we see in our data that climate displacement is very dynamic. We see that there are multiple factors coming in, but climate or extreme weather events being only one of these factors. Um, so the question of attribution to climate change very often comes up. We see that increased climate-related forced migration, so displacement, is often portrayed as a key impact of anthropogenic, so human-induced climate change. However, this kind of causal and quantitative evidence is rather rare or very context-specific. And what we're really interested in is what do people in Somalia, um, which is a region within East Africa, which is um, fairly poor, but also hit by recurrent, recurrent extreme weather events, such as floods and, and droughts in particular. So what do these people actually need when they're displaced, when they're arriving at different locations within Somalia? And we plotted here across the time of 2016 to 2019, the top five priority needs. And we see food, livelihood support, protection and water as the most important um, priority needs over time. And on the, on the y-axis, you see also the number of new dis newly displaced people, which is fairly large over, over the um, years. So how does forecast-based action, forecast-based action come into play here? So First, I think it's, it's important to kind of define this new terminology um, 
And I try to do that within 20 words, um, which is, I guess, fairly difficult, but let's give it a go. So anticipation instead of reaction, that's kind of the, the banner on, on this slide. But forecast-based financing enables the access to humanitarian funding pre-disaster. So before a disaster actually um, hits a certain region. And this is based on both climate and weather forecasts and is combined with risk analysis. So we know essentially with these forecasts where um, an extreme event will hit and what kind of communities could be affected by the type of um, extreme weather event. And there are obviously differences in the timing and the onset of extreme weather events. Droughts um, may shape on a much longer scale compared to floods, which are very, you have to react very quickly and other priority needs um, would be provided essentially. And um, you see on the, on the right side, um, a graph uh, which shows the 18 different regions within Somalia and food as a priority need. And here it's, it's interesting to see kind of as a takeaway um, that people get displaced within the countries, but also within urban areas. So people flee, people get displaced to a certain area and really need food. So kind of going back to the slides, the slide from earlier, we really see that food is a priority need or the biggest priority need. And a couple of other um, takeaways from our ongoing research um, are that we kind of know the type of priority need within the different regions. And this knowledge then can be used in order to transform the past knowledge into forecasts. And I think that's also very important during, during the ongoing um, pandemic because we can uh, hopefully uh, provide a couple of very urgent responses and kind of see where which types of priority needs are needed um, and should be provided across um, Somalia. And I think I'll leave it at that and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'll give you just a second to absorb that screen. And now I'd like to open it up to questions and we already have a couple. Um, the first ones are for Oliver. Uh, and the question is, when did your South African study take place? Uh, it took place last October. Uh, just a five day deployment um, in South Africa last October. Great. And then another question for you. Um, what other novel applications have made use of the raspberry shake and boom, animal related or otherwise? Okay, so there have been um, uh, a couple of studies already um, uh, that I alluded to during my talk. So the first of those was a, a study where they used um, not the raspberry shake and boom, but it's a similar device, the one that I was holding up, the raspberry shake. Uh, where they were looking at rock falls uh, in, a, in the French Alps, or the Swiss Alps, um, and that was quite successful. And then there was also a study that was done by the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, where they tested these uh, to look at earthquakes in Oklahoma. Um, and actually, right now, um, I'm running a test on the raspberry shake and boom sensors on a volcano in Chile. I deployed those in January. And I was hoping to pick them up last month, but obviously I couldn't go back down and pick them up because of the pandemic. Um, so hopefully I can go back down and get that data and see how well they work um, on an active volcano in Chile. Um, yeah, so that's as far as that, those are the only ones that I know of so far. Um, I think there are a few other tests uh, that people are looking at um, around the world. Um, I think there's one in the UK where they're looking at small earthquakes in uh, the south of England. Um, uh, that was done by Steve Hicks and um, there might be some other ones that are in the works but those are the on only ones that I know of. Great, thank you very much. Um, a question for Philippe now. Um, as higher primary productivity in the ocean is frequently associated with colder waters less than 24 degrees Celsius, how do you resolve the swimming behavior of little turtles between feeding and swimming toward warmer waters? Yes, thank you. That, that's an excellent question. Allow me to get into some more details of my habitat model. Can I share my screen? Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay. 
I just want to go back to the slide with uh, the animation. And, uh, okay. Okay, so, so basically the question is, uh, yeah, how, how do we resolve this problem? First of all, I, I must say that the temperature of 24 degrees I mentioned, that that's the minimum temperature in which uh, little ladybugs are, are surviving. Uh, actually, the, the thermal preferendum, so the range of temperatures that these uh, ectotherm, so ectothermic animals can, can sustain, goes down as the animal is growing bigger. Actually, small ladybugs have a small tolerance to, to cold temperatures, but as they're growing uh, bigger and older, they, they, they become more sturdy and, and they can uh, actually ladybugs, the adult ladybugs at the sea turtles that can sustain the lowest temperatures. Some, some individuals have been uh, seen, adults have been seen of Newfoundland in uh, nearly freezing waters. So basically in the model, we factor this in and we, we have a heat budget of uh, the individual and, and based on this, we, we adapt uh, the minimum temperature. So as the individual grows, the, the minimum temperature goes down. Also, at the, as the individual grows, the, 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 the amount of nutrition needed, uh, the, the amount of food needed for an individual goes up. So uh, basically that's what you see in the animation. Uh, basically at the beginning, all, all the warm enough temperature, the warm enough zone is, is all brown. And as the time will go on, you will see that the, the, the limit of the, the acceptable uh, area goes up. That means towards higher latitudes, so to, towards colder water. And uh, let me go on with the animation. Uh, I will speak as it goes up. First of all, you, you see the seasonal cycle, but you, you see also that the, the center of the gyre is getting less favorable because the individuals are growing and they get less food in there. But basically what we see is that, that we, they concentrate in, uh, let me see, I will try to stop at the favorable time. Okay, here, around, around, along this 40 north area, we have uh, basically the temperature, we have an area, a tongue of a favorable area with, where the temperature is okay and when there is a lot of food. So uh, individuals will tend to concentrate on this area. And when you will see when I, when I le will let it go is that, actually this, this favorable area goes up and down, inducing a seasonal migration that has been actually observed in other species. But basically the story is that uh, in, in those cold places, the animals will go up during summer to, to reach the areas where, colder areas where, where, the, where there is more food, but the, when the water temperature is, is warm enough for them, and they will come back towards south during winter to get into warmer temperature, but they will accept less food. And so most of, most of the story when they cross the Atlantic is that they cross the Atlantic doing seasonal migration, always finding, finding the trade-off between temperature and food. So during, during winter, they will go down and uh, accept less food. And during summer, they will go for food. And so they, they will go, go up north. Other areas in, in tropical areas li like uh, the, of Mauritania, you don't have the seasonal thing because uh, the, the, the area is permanently favorable because the water tem temperature remains acceptable of, all the time and there is permanent primary production because of a permanent upwelling there. So you can see that, that sea turtles indeed do a seasonal cycle as a trade-off between the temperature and the food and in areas where, where the habitat is always good because the food remains there and there is enough temperature. Uh, they, they remain there. So, so indeed, there is a permanent trade-off between looking for food and looking for, for good temperature, and that's why they're moving. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is for Lisa. And uh, two questions, actually. Uh, what type of move registers as a displacement, and how do you distinguish between climate-related moves and the wider global trend of urbanization? I think this is a very relevant question. Um, so in general, um, what registers as displacement? I think I start with that one first. So anything which is picked up by, um, by surveys as forced migration is for instance, um, officially registered as displacement. Displacement is also um, mainly internal. That means within countries, within different regions of a country. So uh, cross-border movements uh, or international migration uh, may be forced or not. We don't see that very often. Mainly people get displaced um, on a forcefully based um, and, and kind of go to the nearest and closest um, shelter or safe haven that they, they can go to. 
um, we don't really we don't really see that that they are there long term. However, when uh, we look at internal displacement camps, um, we see various different dynamic structures of why people cannot leave um, ID so-called IDP camps. Um, also, in in terms of of uh, extreme weather events. Um, the, the data we have on Somalia actually distinguishes between those who are displaced due to droughts, due to flood and conflict. And we can kind of um, disentangle these different uh, displacement um, flows um, with uh, underlining conflict data um, or uh, climate and extreme weather event related data uh, to prove kind of the, the drought or the, the flood link. And then how do we distinguish between climate related movements and the kind of global trend of urbanization is also a very relevant um, question because um, mainly we see that people, um, it, especially in the context of drought, we see kind of, first of all, a very um, limited, um, limited displacement at the onset of, um, of a drought and people kind of try to adapt in other ways. But the first migration response would be, uh, for instance, young adults who voluntarily search um, are in search of new wages, go to urban areas, try to um, mainly, you know, leave their agricultural life and, and try to have a new life um, and, and more money essentially uh, in urban areas. Uh, and this is often also in, in nearby urban areas. And as the drought conditions persist, um, we kind of see out migration from, from those areas which are um, affected most, but again, um, mainly internal within the country. So I would say that uh, climate-related displacement actually contributes to the urbanization trend. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Oliver, and that is, can you talk a little more about the sorts of things you could conceivably study with these signals? So what aspects of behavior, for example? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of really, there's two important things that um, ecologists are quite uh, interested in elephants that we could study with the signals. The first of those is the movement patterns of the elephants and the herds in particular areas such as national parks. You know, we, could, we want to know exactly uh, where exactly the herds are moving, um, why they're moving from place to place. Um, are they moving in response to something or are they just moving uh, out of their own free will? Um, so that's one of the most important things. Um, the second important thing is um, we want to understand the communication um, me mechanics. Um, so how exactly are the elephants talking to each other? Um, how far away can they talk to each other from each other? So some people think that they can, they can speak to each other using these rumblings as far away as 16 kilometers, but more recent studies may be that um, it actually may be uh, three kilometers away from each other. Um, and also, uh, how do the herds talk to each other? So are, there, are the herds responding to each other? Are they warning each other of danger? Um, so it's, it's these communication patterns is the other really important thing that we want to understand uh, with, with these signals. So the movement patterns and communications, those, those are the two important things that we want to use signals for. Okay, the next question is also for you, Oliver. Um, it seems that the raspberry shaken boom picks up just the rumblings of the elephants. What about footfalls? Is the device able to pick up that? Yes, absolutely. So there was, I did, there was a slide I had in my presentation. I'll just share my screen to show you that slide again. Um, so this, this particular slide. Um, so this particular slide here, they actually showed you that we did record footfalls uh, with the elephants here. So each of these peaks here, we think is an individual foot hitting the ground and it's been picked up by the raspberry shake sensor um, uh, as, as the elephant was walking past the sensor during the deployment in South, South Africa. So yes, so we can pick up the elephant's rumbling and the footsteps. Um, the question is that uh, we're actually disappointed with the range of the sensor. So this particular sensor only picked it up within 15 meters of the sensor, but there have been other studies where they picked it up as, as far away as a kilometer, maybe a couple of kilometers away. So one of the things we want to do in the future is can we improve the sensitivity of the raspberry shake and beam sensor? Can we change the way we put the sensor in the ground so we can improve the range of that sensor? Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is for Philippe, um, and that is, why don't the turtles spread to the Eastern Mediterranean where water temperatures can be higher um, than in the Western Mediterranean? 
Yes, good question too. Uh, the fact is that, well, as, I, as I explained from previous questions, I mean, the, the places where the turtle go depends on both the temperature and the amount of food available. And I suspect that if they don't go to the Eastern Mediterranean uh, Sea, it's, bec uh, it's because they don't find enough food. I mean, it's a less productive area than the Western Med. Uh, we haven't looked into the details of that uh, question uh, because we were so happy with the results because the this distribution of the turtles that we get in the Mediterranean Sea uh, matches almost perfectly a uh, data from, uh, from uh, Italian colleague Paolo Casale who, who, who just uh, actually synthesize all, all stranding data for leatherbacks in the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. And it is clear that actually the uh, leatherbacks are very rare in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so, so the model fits the data. Uh, the exact reason we haven't looked it into it, but I believe that's because there is, there is less food available in the Eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. There are other species, smaller species of turtles present in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Logarette turtles and green turtles are present there, but I suspect they have a smaller food uh, request. Okay, and then I have another question also for you, Philippe, and that is, how do you deal with the energy consumption of the turtles? So for example, turtles getting tired as they swim. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something that, we, that is not yet factored in the, uh, in the, in the model, but that, that's a very pertinent question. Actually, that's the, that's the next uh, improvement of the model that we are planning. Actually, we want to include a model, uh, an equation that will control what we call the, the fitness of the, the animal, so that will take into account its, its energy budget, and the energy budget will, will control not only the fact that the turtle may, may, may get tired and, and, and swim more slowly, as Michael uh, suggests, but uh, we believe also that the fitness will control the, the growth of the animal. Basically, we, we have reptiles, so, so they have relatively low energy demands. Their basal metabolism is, is low, uh, and uh, so they can adapt to, to harsh conditions. But anyway, um, uh, this, this is something that we need to do and that we will do. The idea is that we have all the elements in the model to take into account and well, to, to build an, uh, an energy budget of, of the individual that, that can control not only the swimming speed, but also, uh, maybe more importantly, the, the, um, the growth of the animal and maybe its mortality too. Okay, and there's one more question for Oliver now. Um, and that is, there is some suggestion that we could find infrasound signals that elephants use as an alarm call and then use those same signals to keep the animals away from populated areas so that they don't come into conflict with humans. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so I'm really glad you asked this because that's exactly one of the points of the project we're working on. Um, so one of the idea, so just to start this question, so infrasound that Jonathan is talking about, infrasound is basically the same as the sound that we listen to, but it's below the threshold of human hearing, which is 20 hertz. So 20 hertz and below, we can't hear it, but the elephants have been found to generate that kind of noise. So I think it's about 17 hertz is what elephants mostly generate, but sometimes there might be hints of a little bit lower than that. Infrasound is quite interesting because it can actually travel quite a lot further away than uh, the sounds that we can hear. So it's quite, it's a useful of elephants that are trying to communicate to each other for long distances. Um, so Jonathan is quite right that they can use these alarm call. And one of the ideas that we're hoping to do with the raspberry shake and boom sensor is develop some kind of system that we can um, uh, we can deploy in national parks or in places where elephants might wander through human through human um, settlements, and we can develop some kind of alarm system. So the rice bee shake and boom picks up what they think is an elephant signal. It can send out an alert to the to the people in that area and say, okay, elephants in the area. Um, you might want to just drive them away peacefully, um, and for example, like that. So yes. It just, that's sort of a, one of the things we are very interested in that we're hoping to develop um, in, the, in, the, in the near future with the Vice Bishop Shaking Boom. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? I'll give people just a minute to type in case they have anything else. So if there's no more questions, then we'll finish here. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, and just to let you know that um, EGO will present one additional press conference 
and that's going to be A Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is loosely based on Jules Verne's classic novel. Um, and that will start in about uh, 20 minutes. And you do need a different link um, to join that press conference. And you can find that on the media website, eg media.egu.eu. Uh, thank you all so much. Appreciate your time.